from the Indies, sir, said the second-hand dealer, pressing his palms together. Genuine calamander wood, a rare good buy, sir. Well, I'll take it, replied Ernest Marx, somewhat hesitantly. He had been strolling idly through the antique and second-hand shop when the chest caught his attention. It had a rich, exotic look which pleased him. In appearance, the dark brown, black-striped wood resembled ebony, and the chest was quite capacious. It was at least two feet wide and five feet long, with a depth of nearly three feet. When Mox learned that the dealer was willing to dispose of it for only twelve dollars, he could not resist buying it. What made him hesitate a little was the dealer's initial low price and quite obvious pleasure upon completing the transaction. Was that fine-grained wood only inlay, or did the chest contain some hidden defect? When it was delivered to his room the next day, he could find nothing wrong with it. The calamander wood was solid and sound, and the entire chest appeared to be in fine condition. The lid clicked smoothly into place when lowered, and the big iron key turned readily enough. Feeling quite satisfied with himself, Mox carefully polished the dark wood and then slid the chest into an empty corner of his room. The next time he changed his lodgings, the chest would prove invaluable. Meanwhile, it added just the right exotic touch to his rather drab chamber. Several weeks passed, and although he still cast occasional admiring glances at his new possession, it gradually began to recede from his mind. Then one evening his attention was returned to it in a very startling manner. He was sitting up reading late in the evening when for some reason his eyes lifted from his book and he looked across the room toward the corner where he had placed the chest. A long white finger protruded from under its lid. He sat motionless, overwhelmed with sudden horror, his eyes riveted on this appalling object. It just hung there, unmoving, a long, pale finger with a heavy knuckle bone and a black nail. After his first shock, Max felt a slow rage kindling within him. The finger had no right to be there. It was unreasonable and idiotic. He resented it bitterly, much as he would have resented the sudden intrusion of an unsavory rumor from down the hall. His peaceful, comfortable evening was ruined by this outrageous manifestation. With an oath, he hurled his book straight at the finger. It disappeared. At least he could no longer see it. Tilting his reading light so that its beam shot across the room, he strode to the chest and flung open the lid. There was nothing inside. Dropping the lid, he picked up his book and returned to the chair. Perhaps he reflected he had been reading too much lately. His eyes, in protest, might be playing tricks on him. For some time longer he pretended to read, but at frequent intervals he lifted his eyes and looked across the room toward the calamander chest. The finger did not reappear, and eventually he went to bed. A week passed, and he began to forget about the finger, he stayed out more during the evening and read less, and by the end of the week he was quite convinced that he had been the victim of nothing more than an odd hallucination brought on by simple eye strain. At length, at the beginning of the second week, deciding that his eyes had had a good rest, he bought some current magazines and made up his mind to spend the evening in his room. Some time after he took up the first magazine, he glanced over at the chest and saw that all was as it should be. Settling comfortably in his chair, he became absorbed in the magazine and did not put it aside for over an hour. As he finally laid it down and prepared to pick up another, his eyes strayed in the direction of the chest. And there was the finger. It hung there as before, motionless, with its thick knuckle and repulsive black nail. Crowding down an impulse to rush across the room, Max slowly reached over to a small table which stood near his chair and felt for a heavy metal ashtray. As his hand closed on the tray, his eyes never left the finger. 
Rising very slowly, he began to inch across the room. He was certain that the ashtray, if wielded with force, would effectively crush anything less substantial than itself which it descended on. It was made of solid metal, and it possessed a sharp edge. When he was a scant yard away from the chest, the finger disappeared. When he lifted the lid, the chest, as he had expected, was empty. Feeling considerably shaken, he returned to his chair and sat down. Although the finger did not reappear, he could not drive its hideous image out of his mind. Before going to bed, he reluctantly decided that he would get rid of the chest. He was in sound health, and his eyes had had a week's rest. Therefore, he reasoned, whatever flaw in nature permitted the ugly manifestation rested not with him, but with the chest itself. Looking back, he recalled the second-hand dealer's eagerness to sell the chest at a ridiculously low price. The thing must already have had an evil reputation when the antique dealer acquired it. Knowing it, the unscrupulous merchant had readily consented to part with it for a small sum. Max, a practical young man, admitted the possibility of a non-physical explanation only with reluctance, but felt that he was not in a position to debate the matter. The preservation of stable nerves came first. All other considerations were secondary. Accordingly, on the following day, before leaving for work, he arranged with his landlady to have the chest picked up and carted off to the city dump. He included specific directions that upon arrival it was to be burned. When he arrived back at his room that evening, however, the first thing that met his gaze was the calamander chest. Furious, he hurried down the hall to his landlady's apartment and demanded an explanation. Why had his orders been ignored? When she was able to get a word in, the patient woman explained that the chest actually had been picked up and carted off to the dump. Upon arrival, however, the man in charge of the dump had assured the men who lugged in the chest that there must have been some mistake. Nobody in his right mind, he asserted, would destroy such a beautiful and expensive article. The men must have picked up the wrong one. Surely there must have been another left behind, he said, which was the worthless one the owner wanted discarded. The two men who had taken the chest to the dump, not feeling secure in their own minds about the matter, and not wishing to make a costly mistake, had returned the chest later in the day. Completely nonplussed by this information, Mox muttered an apology to the landlady and went back to his room, where he plopped into a chair and sat staring at the chest. He would, he finally decided, give it one more chance. If nothing further happened, he would keep it. Otherwise, he would take immediate and drastic measures to get rid of it once and for all. Although he had planned to attend the concert that evening, it began to rain shortly after six o'clock, and he resigned himself to an evening in his room. Before starting to read, he locked the chest with the iron key and put the key in his pocket. It was absurd that he had not thought of doing so before. This would, he felt, be the decisive test. While he read, he maintained a keen watch on the chest, but nothing happened until well after eleven when he put aside his book for the evening. As he closed the book and started to rise, he looked at the chest, and there was the finger. In appearance, it was unchanged. Instead of hanging slack and motionless, however, it now seemed to be imbued with faint life. It quivered slightly, and it appeared to be making weak attempts to scratch the side of the chest with its long black nail. When he finally summoned up sufficient courage, Max took up the metal ashtray as before and crept across the room. This time he actually had the tray raised to strike before the finger vanished. It seemed to whisk back into the chest. With a wildly thumping heart, Max lifted the lid. Again the box was empty. But then he remembered the iron key in his pocket, and a new thrill of horror coursed down his spine. 
The hideous digital apparition had unlocked the chest. Either that, or he was rapidly losing his sanity. Completely unnerved, he locked the chest for a second time, and then sat in a chair and watched it until two o'clock in the morning. At length, exhausted and deeply shaken, he sought his bed. Before putting out the light, he ascertained that the chest was still locked. As soon as he fell asleep, he experienced a hideous nightmare. He dreamed that a persistent scratching sound woke him up, that he arose, lit a candle, and looked at the chest. The protruding finger showed just under the lid, and this time it was galvanized with an excess of life. It twisted and turned, drummed with its thick knuckles, scratched frantically with its flat black nail. At length, as if it suddenly became aware of his presence, it became perfectly still, and then very deliberately beckoned for him to approach. Flooded with horror, he nevertheless found himself unable to disobey. Setting down the candle, he slowly crossed the room like an automaton. The monstrous beckoning finger drew him on like some infernal magnet which attracted human flesh instead of metal. As he reached the chest, the finger darted inside, and the lid immediately lifted. Overwhelmed with terror, and yet utterly unable to stop himself, he stepped into the chest, sat down, drew his knees up to his chin, and turned onto his side. A second later, the lid slammed shut, and he heard the iron key turn in the lock. At this point in the nightmare, he awoke with a ringing scream. He sat up in bed and felt the sweat of fear running down his face. In spite of the nightmare, or because of it, he dared not get up and switch on the light. Instead, he burrowed under the bedclothes and lay wide awake until morning. After he had regained some measure of self-composure, he went out for black coffee and then, instead of reporting to his job, rode across town to the modest home of a truck driver and mover whom he had hired at various times in the past. After some quite detailed and specific plans had been agreed upon, he paid the mover ten dollars and departed with a promise to pay him an equal amount when the job was done. After lunch, considerably relieved, he went to work. He entered his room that evening with a confident air, but as soon as he looked around, his heart sank. Contrary to instructions, the mover had not picked up the chest. It remained in the corner, just where it had been. This time, Max was more depressed than angry. He sought out a telephone and called up the mover. The man was profusely apologetic. His truck had broken down, he explained, just as he was starting out to pick up the chest. The repairs were nearly completed, however, and he would absolutely be out to carry off the chest the first thing in the morning. Since there was nothing else he could do, Mox thanked him and hung up. Finding himself unusually reluctant to return to his room, he ate a leisurely dinner at a nearby restaurant and later attended a movie. After the movie, he stopped and had a hot chocolate. It was nearly midnight before he got back to his room. In spite of his nightmare of the previous evening, he found himself looking forward to bed. He had lost almost an entire night's sleep, and he was beginning to feel the strain. After assuring himself that the calamander chest was securely locked, he slipped the iron key under his pillow and got into bed. In spite of his uneasiness, he soon fell asleep. Some hours later, he awoke suddenly and sat up. His heart was pounding. For a moment, he was not aware of what had awakened him. Then he heard it. A furious scratching, tapping, thumping sound came from one corner of the room. Trembling violently, he got out of bed, crossed the room, and pressed the button on his reading lamp. Nothing happened. Either the electricity was shut off or the light bulb had burned out. He pulled open a drawer of the lampstand and frantically searched for a candle. By the time he found one and applied a match to its wick, the scratching sound had redoubled in intensity. The entire room seemed filled with it. Shuddering, he lifted the candle and started across the room toward the calamander chest. 
As the wavering light of the candle flickered into the far corner, he saw the finger. It protruded far out of the chest, and it was writhing with furious life. It thrummed and twisted, dug at the chest with its horrible black nail, tapped and turned in an absolute frenzy of movement. Suddenly, as he advanced, it became absolutely still. It hung down limp. Engulfed with terror, Mox was convinced that it had become aware of his approach and was now watching him. When he was halfway across the room, the finger slowly lifted and deliberately beckoned to him. With a rush of renewed horror, Mox remembered the ghastly events of his dream. Yet, as in the nightmare, he found himself utterly unable to disobey that diabolical summons he went on like a man in a trance. Early the next morning, the mover and his assistant were led into Max's room by the landlady. Max had apparently already left for work, but there was no need of his presence since he had already given the mover detailed instructions in regard to the disposal of the chest. The chest, locked but without a key, stood in one corner of the room. The melted wax remains of a candle, burned to the end of its wick, lay nearby. The landlady shook her head. A good way to burn the house down, she complained. I'll have to speak to Mr. Mox, not like him to be so careless. The movers, burdened with the chest, paid no attention to her. The assistant growled as they started down the stairs. Must be lined with lead. Never knew a chest so heavy before. Heavy wood, his companion commented shortly, not wishing to waste his breath. Wonder why he's dumping such a good chest, the assistant asked later as the truck approached an abandoned quarry near the edge of town. The chief mover glanced at him slyly. I guess I know, he said. He bought it of Jason Kinkle, and Kinkle never told him the story on it. But he found out later, I figure, and that's why he's ditching it. The assistant's interest picked up. What's the story, he asked. They drove into the quarry grounds and got out of the truck. Kinkle bought it dirt cheap at an auction, the mover explained as they lifted out the chest. Auction of old Henry Stubberton's furniture. The assistant's eyes widened as they started up a steep slope with the chest. You mean the Stubberton they found murdered in a, in a chest, the mover finished for him. This chest. Neither spoke again until they set down the chest at the edge of a steep quarry shaft. Glancing down at the deep water which filled the bottom of the shaft, the mover wiped the sweat from his face. A pretty sight, they say he was, all doubled up and turning black. Seems he wasn't dead when they shut him in, though. They say he must have tried to claw his way out. When they opened the chest, they found one of his fingers jammed up under the lid near the lock. Tried to pick the lock with his fingernail, it looked like. The assistant shuddered. Let's be rid of it, then. It's bad luck, sure. The mover nodded. Take hold and shove. They strained together, and in another second the calamander chest slipped over the edge of the quarry, and hurtled toward the pool of black water far below. There was one terrific splash, and then it sank from sight like a stone. That's good riddance, and another tenor for me, the mover commented. Oddly enough, however, he never collected the tenor, for after that day Mr. Ernest Marx dropped completely out of sight. He was never seen or heard of again. The disgruntled mover, never on the best of terms with the police, shrugged off the loss of the tenor and neglected to report the disposal of the chest. And since the landlady had never learned the mover's name, nor where he intended taking the chest, her sparse information was no help in the search. The police concluded that Marx had got into some scrape, changed his name, and effected a permanent change of locale.